good afternoon and good evening and maybe for some people online, good morning. We're really glad to have you here. I am going to help introduce our, thank you, great to hear everyone. Um, I'm going to set up the next session, but not really. I'm just going to say, introduce who I am and why we are excited to be here. My name is Piers Bocock, and I am delighted to be the Vice President of International for Bixel. Some of you may know who Bixel is. Some of you may say, what is a Bixel? <laughs> well, one thing we are today is a diamond sponsor for this event. And I want to say, I want to say thank you to, to Catherine and Jay and Wade and the board of SID for pulling together really an incredible event. A thousand people here, more than a thousand people online. The energy is palpable. You know, it felt like last year we were coming out of a cave and sort of blinking away COVID. We're back. We're back. So thank you, Sid. And in my case, um, it's an opportunity to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, some, I'll speak for myself, have a few more wrinkles, a little bit less hair. Um, some have new employers. The last time I was here, I had a small company. But I am thrilled, absolutely thrilled, to be working with Bixel. Bixel has been a partner for federal agencies for more than 15 years, but has really made a splash and a contribution to international development in the last five years. And our whole purpose is to help the organizations that are trying to make a difference in the world do what they do more effectively, more efficiently, and with the end stakeholder in mind. Our mission is simple, is to change for the good the lives of as many people as possible. We do this through digital development. We do it through strategic communications and engagement. We do it through knowledge management, organizational learning, collaborating learning and adapting. And we are thrilled to be among all of you today. So um, I'm gonna leave you with one thought before I turn things over to Jay. I am somebody who's worked in knowledge management and organizational learning for most of my career. And I like to reflect on things. And one of my sons, I have four, um, last week he's looking at the job market and he said, um, so tell me about your career path as if I had planned this out. How do you, how do you end up a, a vice president at a leading global consulting firm. And I didn't pretend that I had planned it out because I didn't. But I do also, in addition to learning and reflecting like numbers, so I'm gonna give you some numbers. I have had the good fortune to work in more than 30 countries for more than 20 years with more than 10 of the world's largest development organizations and all of them have one thing in common, and that we want to make a positive change in this world. And that's what this conference is about. This is what we're talking about, how to do this moving forward in new ways. So I'm really looking forward sort of to the challenge that Jay put forward to us this morning, which is what can we take away from here? How does this become not just a wonderful opportunity to see people that we've worked with, to see people that we've traveled with, to see people that we've cried with, but how do we take this out of here to make a difference to the people who we're ultimately trying to impact? I'll let you ponder that while I turn things over to Jay Knott to set up our next session. Thank you very much.
All right, good afternoon, everybody. How's the lunch? Good afternoon, everybody. How's the lunch? Did you enjoy the morning? How many people have met their five new people already? All right, all right. New challenge, make it 10. So this is our, our lunch plenary panel. Um, I've, I've anticipated this panel for since we started working on the, on the conference, frankly. Um, and here's the idea. The, the, the idea is the theme of this conference is all about what we call the power shift. What's happening in our world to make it more dynamic. Um, that those at the, at the local level have the greatest amount of voice, agency, in what's going on in their lives. In thinking about that sort of overall theme, the thought was there are some overarching forces that are just driving change across everything. Um, whether you're sitting in Washington, Tokyo, Maputo, or Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea, these forces are or will change your life going forward. The three things we, we thought about are Geopolitics, sort of, I mean, I don't have to explain to you all, geopolitics matter and it's, and it's changing. Climate change, I think everyone knows climate change is changing everything. And I think we're increasingly finding out and understanding that artificial intelligence and machine learning, again, changing everything and will impact you wherever in this world um, you, you happen to live, work, or, or care about. And so the, the idea of this panel is to bring um, three really smart people, not including me, <laughs> but three really smart people, um, experts in their fields across those three areas to really think about, when you think about the power shift and the future, um, what does it look like? Is it positive? Is it optimistic? Is it, is it mixed? Um, what have you? And so, what we're going to explore during this, this, I think we have about an hour, is, is what's happening there and how those things interplay to impact what we think about in international development. The format of this panel is as follows. Um, each speaker, and I'll introduce them in a second, each speaker will have eight, nine minutes, eight, nine minutes, um, to give some opening remarks about what they see um, in, their, in their relative fields. I will ask each speaker a follow-up question, then we'll move on to the next speaker until we hit all three. Following that, we will have plenty of time for uh, moderated discussion amongst the panel, um, um, questions from the audience here, questions from the audience online. For those of you here, you will see, you will see three speaker stands um, arrayed throughout the room. Um, once, you, once we get to that part of the panel, please feel free to move to one of the speakers, form a line, and we'll get to as many questions as we can um, throughout the session. So, my three esteemed panelists are um, Addie Cook, who's, and, and you would have seen their bio, so I'm not gonna go through their long bios, but Addie Cook is, is really working and focused on artificial intelligence at Google. Mafalda Duarte, who is currently head of Climate Investment Funds, incoming executive director of the Green Climate Fund. And can we get Anne-Marie Slaughter so that we can, we can see her online? Anne-Marie Slaughter is online somewhere. I know, she, I know she's piped in. Anne-Marie Slaughter is I can CEO see myself. of New America. Hey, there she is. <laughs> hey, Anne-Marie. Hi, Jim. Anne-Marie, CEO of New America. Um, really, really a deep, deep expert on um, all things geopolitical, as I like to call it. So with that, there you have our speakers. You understand the format, what's happening, and exactly what we're going to be talking about over the course of the next hour. So with that, let's jump into it. Let's start with Addie Cook. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to Sid for having me today. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank all the wait staff who are serving us our wonderful meal today.
as well as all the AV staff and everybody who really is um, working hard to make this event possible in the background. I know um, we all appreciate um, in our field everybody who support us in the background. Um, another reason I'm really excited to participate on this panel, one, is I, I have the honor of serving uh, on this panel with a couple really amazing women. And, and the fact that this is an all-female panel led by our wonderful uh, moderator is really amazing. Um, and I'm a Return Peace Corps volunteer, so um, I know I have a lot of art piece. Yep, I figured there'd be a lot of you in the room. Um, and you know, it was actually my, one of my first gigs right out of college. Um, I was also an AmeriCorps VISTA, in case there's any of you out there. Um, so it's really interesting to, thinking about career paths and you know, how do you end up here doing artificial intelligence policy at Google after being a Peace Corps volunteer, an AmeriCorps VISTA volunteer, and working in public housing in East Los Angeles. Um, and really, I think it's actually kind of obvious. Artificial intelligence is a basket of issues. You know, today we're trying to cover geopolitics and climate change. Um, obviously, we know there's responsible AI issues, ethics, bias, fairness. Um, all of these things are, are really um, just make AI a very rich portfolio of issues. And you really could um, do a deep dive on every single one of them and take many more times than eight minutes that we have today. Um, but it's really why, um, why I, I actually came to work for Google. Um, I support our enterprise business. So um, certainly some of um, the enterprises in the room, some government customers like USAID. Um, and on the enterprise side, we recognize that we have a responsibility to put out products that work for our customers, our, our end users, the ones who are going to deploy the products um, for a very specific use, use case. In the aid world, certainly we can think of a lot of examples, um, delivery of food. We can also think of um, addressing um, critical emergencies that we need to respond to. AI certainly plays, can play a really important role in helping to triage some of the crises that we see. Um, but of course, it also comes with, with, with challenges, right? We wanna make sure that we're deploying it in a fair way, that all the, the concerns have been addressed. And certainly, as I was explaining to somebody earlier, I am not an expert in international development. Even though I, do, I have a, a Peace Corps background, um, I rely on experts across Google and outside of Google, frankly. We, we often work with external experts to come advise us on how specific applications um, might be deployed in certain ways that we need to think about. We invite um, human rights experts. Not only do we have them on staff, but we go out and we seek experts in certain fields for certain applications to advise us on what, what should we be thinking about when we deploy a product. Um, I know that large language models are, are getting a lot, of, um, a lot of talk these days. I've been doing artificial intelligence policy for about six years now. Um, I started at Accenture uh, many moons ago, and I think this year is the first year that people have recognized why I have a job, <laughs> right? Now we're like, oh no, we need regulations. Um, <laughs> So it's gotten very interesting, but that doesn't change um, the approach that we've taken at Google. Um, for the past two years, I've had the pleasure of serving alongside not only our human rights experts, our ethicists, our legal leads, um, but also UX, UR experts. Um, user experience is an important part of how we deliver a technology. And I actually, um, what, it, what really resonates me and perhaps resonates with this audience is um, a story from my own Peace Corps experience about how we need to take the user experience into account. Um, when I was a, a young volunteer um, more than 15 years ago, um, one of the projects they, they sort of hand you when you're, you're going out to your community is a clean stove project. They say, here's some clean stoves, um, here's how to pitch them to the, to the women in your community. Um, and I, so I did it. I, I, took the, I took the pitch manual, I, I brought in a demonstration, I had a whole stove there, and, and I tried to get the women ginned up because in El Salvador and in many places across Latin America and I'm sure other countries, um, uh, uh, respiratory illnesses are, are a massive problem from burning um, smoke and fuels in small habitats, if you've ever experienced experience this, it can get quite smoky and it can damage your, your health long term. So the Clean Stove Project was really meant to alleviate this problem and, and give them another mechanism uh, for, for cooking in a healthier way. 
didn't really take in my community. And I, and I always thought that was very interesting. I moved on to some other projects, working with the school, working with the health department. Years later, I was reading a study that an NGO did about the Clean Stoves project, and they identified a huge problem. When they were developing the stoves, they didn't really consult with enough women who would actually use them. And they found out after some user experience um, surveys and, and interviews with these women that they didn't work for their purposes. It didn't, do, it didn't fulfill the needs of, of their everyday lives. And it was a huge missed opportunity, I think, um, in the delivery of that project, because I know I wasn't the only Peace Corps volunteer told to do this. Um, and I use this as an example because it really, that's a, that's a low tech example, but you can really up level this to a high tech example too. And it's why we need to make sure that as we're developing products um, using artificial intelligence or not, making sure that the end user, the affected party, the one who is meant to, to benefit from the technology is part of the process, is consulted, understands um, how the delivery of these services um, will impact them. And it, and it should be a two-way conversation. One of the things we talk about in our um, product reviews here in Google a lot is feedback loops. They aren't just in the beginning. They aren't right before you deploy a product. They should be throughout the life cycle of the product. And it's a really important consideration. Um, with that, I'm actually gonna, gonna stop. I really look forward to questions and uh, to the other panelists' remarks. Thank you, Addie. Follow-up question. So you talked, you talked about the, I think, the people-level impact of artificial intelligence. And let's, let's face it, there are, there are fears out, about, about, out there about artificial intelligence. Um, will the algorithms take over? Mm. Will our data be our own? Will our identities uh, be our own? So when you think about, and that's just for folks living in this city, right? When you think about the places where we conduct international development, people who, who may be less empowered, how is it that we ensure that artificial intelligence is a tool, that, that artificial intelligence is something that people use as opposed to artificial intelligence being something that happens to you? Mm. Great question. Um, I think artificial intelligence right now is, 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 is sort of scary because people are seeing it used in new ways. I think um, the um, release of the chatbots has brought um, your own ability to interact with AI in a way that is new to you. However, you have been interacting with it in the past for, for a long time now. If you've used Google search, that is all based on artificial intelligence. Your search results might be slightly different than others' search results because it is learning um, how you want to de information delivered to you. Maps, if you use maps, also based on artificial intelligence. Um, and these are really just examples of how we've taken our underlying technology, which is these days large language models, and put them into an interface to deliver a specific service. Um, one way that we are um, ensuring that it is not used in a harmful manner, um, BARD, which is our, um, our version of ChatGPT, has specific filters that are layered on top of it um, to filter out any delivery of um, any content that would have child sexual safety concerns, terrorist content, and there are a number of other filters that we have put on top of the product to make sure that it is um, it, it, it cultivates a good user experience. Yes, it can be mixed used. Really, any technology can be misused. But I would also say a hammer can also be misused, too. And so um, I think it's really up to humans to put the guardrails um, around the technology. And it's why we've supported um, not only um, self-regulatory measures um, ahead of regulation, but also we're, we're very engaged in the regulatory conversation as well. Right. Thank you. Rafalda. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Jay. Uh, and thank you to the Society for International Development for inviting me to, to be here. Um, I feel that this, you know, I'm part of your community. I'm part of this community. I. I have been engaged in international development all of my professional career uh, and, and much like the speaker before, 
um, have had the pleasure um, and honor to uh, live and work in, in many developing countries. Um, <clears throat> I have been focusing more on climate change and climate action for the last um, more than 15 years um, in the broad context of, of international development. Um, and let me say a few things, but you know, of course, I'm, I'm more interested in engaging in the, in the discussion, hearing the questions um, from UJ and, and, uh, and the audience as well. Um, so some of the things that I think are important to reflect upon is, and we saw it recently in some of the news articles, um, we will most likely, um, according to the scientific community, hit the 1.5 temperature increase between uh, 2023, between this year and 2027. Um, and, um, you know, we have different bodies, international bodies like the International Energy Agency and UNEPS saying that based on current policies, um, and, you know, of course there have been improvements in these policies, and because of that we are not looking at higher scenarios, but we are looking at scenarios of 2.5, 2.8 centigrade, sorry, I know I'm in a Fahrenheit world, but... Uh, <laughs> That's a lot. Um, but uh, I, you know, I, I didn't grow up with the Fahrenheit system, so my reference system is uh, Celsius. Um, <clears throat> so, um, we also know from the scientists that, um, and I myself studied a bit of the science, so I, I, I relate a lot to these, uh, to their concerns that um, more and more they are concerned about irreversible tipping points, um, including in the, in the ice sheets. And, and this would have mega impacts, uh, not just in terms of sea level rise. Um, I think it's important to understand, um, and again, the scientists do a lot of research on this. Um, we, ha we humans have not lived in a world before uh, with this concentration of GHG emissions in the atmosphere. Uh, it has happened in our planet in the past, four million years ago, but uh, human beings, we have not. And, um, and so this is quite an uncharted territory uh, for us. Um, and again, it's not just about sea level rise, it's about the whole system, the climate system and its impacts. Um, and we don't have to, you know, we don't have to go far. I mean, I, I, I know that uh, all of you, uh, most of you, if not all, appreciate, this is not a phenomenon that is located in some geographies. Uh, this is happening, we are seeing the impacts globally, um, also here in, in the US. Um, I mean, if you think of uh, Hurricane Ian last year uh, in September and the impacts in, uh, in Florida um, that have been estimated, um, insured losses that were estimated at 47 billion. And just last year in the U.S., we had 18 climate disasters. Um, these are expected to increase in intensity um, and, and frequency. Uh, but we also saw last year, uh, we, you probably saw in the news, Pakistan, major floodings across Pakistan that affected 33 million people and caused 1,500 deaths, including more than 500 children, um, and a damage over $40 billion. Uh, what has been happening more recently as well, as you know, for the past few years, um, is that the world is now being impacted by this multiple crisis. Climate, uh, the COVID, the pandemic, and now the conflict, um, the war in, uh, in Ukraine. And this creates significant challenges. Um, in terms of the COVID-19, uh, we saw for the first time uh, in decades a reversal in terms of global poverty. More than 100 million people that, in addition, um, 
uh, to what we had already before that went back to poverty, living on less than $1.9 a day, um, which bumped the global poverty rate to around, from 8% to around 9%. And more than 160 million people are living on less than $5.5 a day. And, but this is an international development uh, discussion and conference. Um, the income losses of the world's poorest were twice as high as the world's richest. Now, what has happened with the war in Ukraine, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, as we know, has triggered a number of shocks, uh, price shocks uh, on, on food, energy, and the fertilizer. And that has had really significant impacts on the cost of living. Um, <clears throat> so we've seen, we saw last year, just on the Asian region, LNG prices that more than doubled their average prices. And we also saw uh, big impacts in countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh because gas deliveries were actually diverted from the region to Europe. Um, and gas is the major source of countries' electricity for these countries. Again, you know, another interesting uh, data point um, in terms of developing countries. The energy import bills of developed countries is around 2 to 4 percent of GDP. Uh, but in developing countries, it can go over 25 percent. So when we actually have these shocks, um, on the energy prices, they bear a disproportionate brunt uh, of that impact. So this has driven inflation. We know even here in the U.S. and other countries, this has driven inflation. And it has driven central banks to raise interest rates. What happens when interest rates rise? Debt burdens of these countries increase. So we have quite a significant debt situation right now in developing countries. <clears throat> On top, um, their currencies have also depreciated given the appreciation of the dollar um, and therefore, you know, even further straining the fiscal space of these countries. Not only they have to pay more in interest rates, but um, they have to pay more in terms of their local currency. Now, why does this all matter also to climate from a climate perspective? Because we know that when interest rates are above 2%, the average cost of building um, clean power capacity um, <clears throat> becomes higher for green projects vis-a-vis -vis, uh, fossil fuel projects. Um, there are things that can be done, but this is, this is the reality. So all of this to say that um, we really need to continue to um, push for action, more action, more investments, more leadership on climate in developed countries, but even more so in developing countries. Um, we know that there are important investments being made in the U.S., that the IRA calls for massive important investments in this area. Um, this is happening in other continents as well, but we don't see an equivalent level of effort and investments and efficiencies in developing countries. And we will not solve the climate crisis without them. We need to understand this. This is where most of the population lives, this is where most of the energy demand uh, is. This is where most of the global GDP is. So unless if we double down, yes, in countries like the US, in Europe, in Japan and others, uh, but we need to more than double down in terms of support to developing countries. Thank you. Thank you, Mafalda. So part of what you're talking about, of course, is there, there are those who have uh, bear more responsibility for the climate change that we're experiencing are those who are suffering the most from it. And those are two very different groups of countries. One of the things that's talked about in terms of climate finance is there's not enough money there, first of all. And so many countries who are suffering the most are saying, show us the money. 
um, because in some cases they may disappear. We're going to hear later today from the ambassadors from Mozambique and from, from, from Vanuatu, countries who are, are severely suffering from climate change. But with the money that's already there, and it's, and it's billions of dollars, there's also the perspective that that money itself is moving too slowly and, and, in, and in dribs and drabs that aren't necessarily serving the needs. So when you think about risk, and you talked about the fact that we're already looking at catastrophic climate change, when you, talk, when you think about risk, should, climate, should the money that's already there be moving faster, um, with, given that the risk we know versus the risk of, of uh, other, other losses? What's your view on that? I mean, issue, of, uh, so there are the different issues. Uh, quantum is not enough. And I mean, you will hear this from <clears throat> all, develop, all developing uh, countries. And I mean, it doesn't take long. It's just a matter of looking at, you know, how much, uh, how much is being invested in developed countries, how much is being invested in developing countries. So, you know, quantum is one thing. And it's true that, uh, you know, developing countries there was this commitment uh, <clears throat> in, in, uh, at the Copenhagen uh, COP um, to uh, deliver $100 billion of uh, support to developing countries annually to drive climate investments. And everybody has recognized that we haven't, as an international community, been able to, to honor that. And so, you know, the negotiations, the, 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 this, these negotiations this reference comes, comes often. Uh, so everybody recognizes, even developed countries recognize that more needs to be done in terms of, of quantum. <clears throat> and, and you know, we have to understand as well that developing countries, because of what has happened with the pandemic and what they have felt as a lack of insufficient solidarity um, in the context of the pandemic and with the war in Ukraine, them as well being quite impacted and the capability of countries to mobilize significant support for the, for the war effort. Um, but then in, in times of peace, there's an, there isn't an equivalent um, <clears throat> response in terms of, or, or mobilization of support for, for these type of investments in developing countries. So, <clears throat> so that's, that's on quantum, and I think uh, it's something to reflect upon. Um, access, now then the, the countries also talk about access, um, and, and they are rightly so talking about that. There's a lot of mechanisms, there's a lot of what is called as fragmentation. Um, <clears throat> Many initiatives, many institutions, um, and, 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 and countries on the receiving hand have to know how to navigate all of this and maximize um, and, 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 and <laughs> navigate, see how, which ones exist, which already is like a big landscape, uh, how to maximize access to those resources. Um, with, with many different procedures and requirements. So access is a, is a, is a, is a big issue. Uh, I think there is m more is needed in terms of bringing institutions together um, in partnerships and, and uh, using common procedures and, and requirements and really um, you know, bringing the comparative advantages of different initiatives and institutions. Uh, to bear um, and, and in, in, in country support packages that are more meaningful than you know each of these institutions going by its own with its own with their own specific uh, projects. Uh, <clears throat> the task ahead is a task that is not just about investment either. It's about you know, supporting countries change their policy and regulatory frameworks that are enablers of these transitions and investments. Um, but it's, it will require political level engagement and sustained political level engagement because a lot of these changes in policies and regulations are not necessarily the most popular. 
Um, so there has to be a sense of, you know, maintaining a strong sense of partnership with, uh, with these countries, both at the investment level, financing, delivering of finance, but equally at the policy and at the political level. Thank you. Anne-Marie. Jay. So I think the first thing I should say is when Jay Knott called to ask me to do this, I told Jay I would never say no to him, and I wouldn't. Uh, we worked together for many years uh, at Apt Associates. Uh, and I'm also just thrilled to be back at this conference. I was first at this conference in 2010, I think. It might have been 2009 or 2010 when I was the director of policy planning at the State Department. And then the State Department was fighting against moves to make USAID a separate cabinet department. Uh, and many of you educated me in all sorts of ways. I came out after my two years there, really more a development person, at least in aspiration and support, not in expertise, uh, than, than certainly a national security person. So uh, I feel like this is my, has been my teaching community. And just for the record, I now push for USAID to be a separate cabinet department. Uh, but it's uh, nice to be here, even if it has to be virtually, something we could have done, I suppose, a decade ago, but seemed very strange and now seems normal. I want to take the lens back a bit and, and talk more broadly about a framework for thinking about the issues that my fellow panelists have raised, and there'll be quite a bit of overlap. And I want to start with the Obama, uh, a slip, the Biden administration's national security <laughs> strategy uh, released last October, which was really a historic document because it started out with, you know, a definition of U.S. vital national interests, as they all do, and then the greatest threats to those issues, as they all do and talked about the competition and potential conflict with China and Russia and Iran and North Korea, um, the kind of standard geopolitical approach that sees the world in terms of other great powers, if you're the United States, uh, and sees threats to the United States, primarily in terms of configurations of other great powers. But then it went on to talk about transnational challenges. I call them global challenges for reasons we'll talk about, but they said transnational challenges, climate change, infectious disease, uh, energy shortages, food shortages, terrorism, and inflation. Those were the ones that they listed. We could add others. But here's the historic part. They said these transnational challenges are existential threats that are equal in weight and importance to the geopolitical threats. That is really historic because it's the United States saying, you know, these issues that affect all of us, exactly as Mafalda just said, you know, it's, it's all of us. You cannot cabin climate change you, you, or infectious disease, those big global threats are just as important as China or Russia uh, or other geopolitical threats. Now, the words are historic. We, we're not remotely close to actually implementing those words. I mean, just look at the size of the defense budget versus diplomacy and certainly development. You can take, as you should take, if you're thinking about global threats, then a lot of domestic spending is also relevant, all the climate spending, because of course it is partly what can the United States do to carry its part of the burden. So the CDC and HHS, and um, I would certainly, and agriculture, all the domestic agencies that have a piece of that, even if you put all that together, you don't get remotely close uh, to the defense budget. So if you were really serious that this is these threats are just as important as the threats from China or Russia, you'd be spending your money very differently and you'd be spending your time very differently. Uh, and I, I have great admiration for many of the folks in the Biden administration. They were my colleagues in the Obama administration. 
But I also know what it's like to be at the National Security Council or at the top of any of these big departments. And I am quite certain that the national security team is not spending half its time on global threats and half on geopolitics. I'd say they're probably spending 60 percent of their time on the war in Ukraine and the rest, you know, another big chunk on China or some other division of that. And those two overlap uh, and then relatively small amount. Uh, on these other issues, even though I know the president really and, and his staff really do care about climate change. But I start with the with the idea that at least in theory, although with a huge gap in practice, the United States is moving to where it needs to be, which is to actually recognize that simply, you know, who's going to win this century, a whole a whole term and way of thinking that I find really counterproductive to solving these problems is irrelevant if the climate is no longer habitable or no longer habitable in the way it has been, exactly as Mafalda said. But people will survive, but not in the way uh, that, that uh, we know of it. And I would add AI as one of those global threats, uh, also a, an enormous global opportunity. Uh, I, I, I agree with Addy there, but I also think this is much like the dawn of the nuclear age, except more dangerous because anybody uh, can get hold uh, of a lot of this, a lot of AI technology. So with that, um, let me just then relate that uh, to the geopolitics or simply the different global configuration of power. Because precisely as Mafalda said, you know, India very, the, the Biden administration has been courting India has been courting India as a fellow democracy, sees India as part of the, you know, the bulwark that the community of democracies puts up against the autocracies, uh, got India much more engaged in the quad and in, in working on pandemic issues. And then comes the war in Ukraine and India is buying as much gas and oil from Russia as it possibly can. Why? You just heard why, because India and Pakistan have got to be able to enable their, their people uh, to have the energy they need. And a lot of that energy was getting diverted. So uh, VS, the Minister for External Affairs, Dr. Jai Shankar, just said point blank, of course, we're going to do this. This is our interest. And then he said, you know, we, we see ourselves as a great power in a multi-aligned world. And that's very important because all these countries that the United States expects to line up with us, India, Brazil, South Africa, uh, often Egypt, Indonesia, Mexico, these are all countries that have taken their own position on the war in Ukraine. And why? Because these global issues, which all of you know are development issues, because ultimately they're only going to be really fixed with public health systems and energy transitions and uh, capacity and knowledge transfers on all sorts of, of tech. Uh, those issues are more important to the vast majority of the world's people and the governments that represent the vast majority of the world's people than the traditional geopolitical agenda. So that is, I think, where we are uh, in, in the world. It, it makes for tremendous turbulence. Uh, it makes for the unfitness of global institutions. I just spent uh, 18 months on a high-level advisory board on effective multilateralism, advising uh, the Secretary General we issued a report. It's called A Breakthrough for People and Planet. It talks about people and planet-centered global politics and what it takes to get to effective multilateralism. But as you all know, there is a vast gap, again, between those recommendations and the fact that the United States and Europe are not even willing to consider a non-American or a non-European to run the World Bank or the IMF. So I would... Um, conclude by saying, I think we are, we're, we're in a policy poly crisis. I think this year and next at, at UNGA, this year at the, um, millennia, the Sustainable Development Goals Conference, where we're going to see that we're sliding backwards in some cases, and that these, again, if it's a global institution and it represents uh, the majority of the world's people, and it is effective, 
then it has to devote far more uh, to the to these problems. And if it isn't effective, then it's time for its replacement either by regional institutions or, and more likely and more dangerously, by just countless clubs, right? The expansion of the G20 to the G30 and then many other G groups. That's a, that is not a, a happy way forward. Uh, but then again, next year at the Summit for the Future, there's a positive agenda that says the world sees just how broken the global governance system is, and it sees the threats, both geopolitical, a terrible war in Ukraine, and still a hundred conflicts that the ICRC has listed uh, in, in terms of the conflicts where it has to, to act. A hundred conflicts, none of them getting nearly the attention uh, that the war in Ukraine uh, is getting. But a, a possibility that the world says, you know, we're not, the crisis now is just as great as the crisis that we went through through World War I and World War II, and we have to do something about it. That's the positive scenario. Uh, whether or not that happens, I think we all, uh, global problem solvers, have to think differently. We have to stop making the division between diplomacy and development because you need diplomacy on all these issues, but my God, do you need development? These are global issues. They are in the end going to be solved at the, at the city level, the county level, the province level, then the national level, then the global level. We need to build that infrastructure that runs from mayor's offices or whatever the local official uh, equivalent is to national governments, to global authorities, but equally, we need to build an infrastructure that includes, yes, all the world's governments. They are not going away and they are still more legitimate uh, than you know, your favorite NGO or your favorite corporation. And yet we won't solve those global problems without the mechanisms to bring in all the public sector with, together with the private and civic sector. So um, I think it's an extraordinary time to be in this field, to be grappling with the issues that have traditionally been cabined as development issues. They are global issues and they are existential issues and they deserve as much attention and as much money and as much time as the US-Chinese rivalry, the war in Ukraine uh, or any traditional geopolitical issues. And I'll stop there. I don't know anyone who, who can better sort of put into context the transnational geopolitical issues into global governance and then relate it to international development. Um, but the question is what, what to do about it. So you, Anne-Marie, you used to have a theory about this. So in 2004, you wrote a book called A New World Order in which you, you theorized that, that we could approach problems through a network of, of leaders, um, technocrats, those beneath the political leadership who formed international transnational networks for, for cooperation, collaboration, and that that would be how things get done. But here we are, 2023, and stuff is messed up, Anne-Marie. Like, everywhere you look, stuff is messed up. So if you had to do a revised re edition of a new world order, would you change anything? <laughs> well, if I wouldn't change anything, that would speak terribly of me. It would mean I hadn't learned anything in almost two decades. I certainly would. But I would still maintain the thesis that the reason I thought these global networks uh, of national officials were so important was because they, they held the levers of national change. Right? They were the ones, the environmental ministers, the health ministers, the justice ministers, and critically, of course, the finance ministers, the central bankers, the securities regulators. I'll note that since then, the, those networks of financial, the, all those financial regulators, central bankers, finance ministers, securities regulators, and insurance regulators have all come together under something called the Financial Stability Board, which is, I would argue, as important uh, as the IMF in terms of, of, of many, getting many things done. I'd make a couple of changes, I'd make many, but the core ones would be to say, look, 
what I was describing was much more developed in the in Europe and the United States and, and transatlantically. So the EU is an, a, a basically a, an institution made up of those networks. And the EU, for all its problems, is a, does succeed in brokering compromises between 20, you know, almost 30 nations. That's extraordinary. And it does, it is ahead on a lot of climate issues. And it did better, certainly on the pandemic, far better than the United States, but better than many other uh, uh, places. A little better if you take Britain out, which isn't quite fair because Brexit wasn't, wasn't con concluded. But I would say both ASEAN and particularly the African Union are moving more and more in, in the, uh, the direction of effective government networks. Uh, and that that is still something we need to build out. Um, I would actually, for instance, if I were, were advising uh, the British, I would say they need to focus much more on the Commonwealth now, not as the leader, but as a major hub uh, in, the, in the Commonwealth and build out those networks. The thing that was missing, a one of the many things that was missing was again, you can't do that without also connecting those ministers to the international institutions. Again, unless you just start over with the UN and the IMF and the World Bank, which would take us decades, you need to build in ways of actually uh, connecting and integrating between the supranational or the, the traditional international officials uh, and their national counterparts, which this secretary general has done a little of, but you need much more of. And you, you ultimately do need, again, all the other actors. So I would now say that's a piece of the puzzle. The puzzle's much larger. You need, and you also need to have very clear goals. And here I would go to the SDGs, but I'd break the SDGs down into much more measurable, uh, the SDGs are kind of missions and you break them into goals and you assign them to different hubs of both national, international, uh, and, and local uh, officials, as well as other global actors. Very messy, um, but better than nothing. And I think with enough urgency, it can be made to work much better than it's working now. Okay, good. So we've concluded sort of our, our opening statements and the follow-up questions. If folks want to on, in, um, in the room want to head to, to the mics for your questions, we're be beginning to take those. And if folks online want to send your questions to the chat, somehow someone will tell me um, when we have those and I'll be able to ask those um, of our group. Catherine? No. <laughs> <laughs> Try it now. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. I have three questions from our virtual audience. Okay. Okay. I'll give you the first. Uh, Rebecca Gianotti asks, says, I would love to hear from each of their perspectives if they see any particular opportunities to shift power to vulnerable communities moving forward i.e. not just how global power shifts impact communities, but on the theme of shifting power within international development, what could that shift look like? Okay, we'll start there. We'll start with Mafalda first. I mean, um, certainly um, it is important to bring the voices of these local communities to different governance levels. Um, this is one thing, for example, that, um, you know, in the context of the climate investment funds that uh, we have been sponsoring quite a lot is to have representatives from local communities, indigenous people, um, at the governance, you know, at, at the places where decisions are, are made, they can, they can bring their, um, their experience and, um, you know, and, and, and really convey the, the voices from, from, from the local level up to these fora where, where decisions are, are being made um, at a much more international, uh, at international level. 
this needs to happen at different levels. Um, also, you know, working with with countries to make sure that you know they give these uh, opportunities as well to local communities to have to have voice. Um, but it's important to find ways, um, and we ourselves have have also been uh, quite um, championing this and, and sponsor this finding ways of giving these communities agency by having access to resources, uh, mm. having access to, to tangible resources. So it's a matter of, to me, it's a matter of voice and giving them voice through various platforms and foreign, national, local, international. Um, you know, we see this also happening at the COP in terms of climate change, their presence, creating spaces so that their voices increasingly are heard and and, and taken into account. Um, but, you know, how does one enable agency is, is, is through that voice, but also through resources. So um, there's quite a bit of, oh, there are some mechanisms out there that, that really get to the, what you might call, you know, those communities, those indigenous people groups, the most vulnerable that have really not had the access before. And it's a question of how do we scale that up? Thank you. Uh, Anne-Marie, you want to go next? Yes. I mean, it, it is a hard problem. Uh, I have two ways of thinking about it. One is thinking about the impact of any policy on the most vulnerable as being the relevant metric, uh, so that when you are putting metrics in place, you are thinking either if we lift up the most vulnerable, uh, then that lifts everyone. Or uh, you you can't put in place, you can't put in policies aimed, say, at the middle class, unless you can demonstrate how those policies also lift up the most vulnerable, because otherwise you're just widening gaps that will create uh, it their own problems. So that is one, really building that into metrics. That's not the same, however, as giving local voices actual agency. But here, it, and Jay raised this actually in his opening remarks, the question is capacity. I mean, I've seen, I started as an international lawyer. I've worked with law firms. Indeed, I represented Nicaragua against the United States uh, in its lawsuit uh, for the CIA mining of its harbors. And we had a Nicaraguan lawyer, a good one. But he needed to work with a British lawyer, a French lawyer, and several American lawyers because Nicaragua didn't have the capacity uh, to actually do the work necessary uh, at, at the International Court of Justice. And that is very tricky. How do you partner and enable without ultimately taking over uh, and depriving the very group you're trying to help of its own agency? And it may well disagree. Uh, so there's a very micro level there that I, I think simply you have to work through. Uh, at the more macro level, you can put in put mechanisms in place that essentially say, look, if you're not listening and talking and measuring the impact uh, on the most vulnerable, you're not you're not going to get uh, get there in terms of of support for your whole policy. I think one of the things that Anne Marie spoke to in, in her opening remarks was um, global alignment and the, the geopolitical problems that artificial intelligence does, does bring about. Um, we see a fracturing right now across, across the globe in different um, um, postures towards AI and how it should be used. Surveillance is a huge concern in many parts of the world and how the technology is being used. And it's why there's been um, more recently a call to continue the work that the OECD kicked off several years ago. The US was a signer on the 2018 AI principles that have now um, continued to support the discussions um, in Europe, for instance, um, where they have pursued um, a, the EU AI Act, which is based on protecting fundamental rights. Um, it will specifically have a fundamental rights impact assessment. 
And as we know from data privacy um, globally, Europe is, is a leader and we ex already have seen similar discussions in Latin America and in Asia um, and in Middle East and North Africa on what are the best ways to, to take a page out of Europe's book and really continue the work of the, of the OECD's AI principles and find global alignment. But I, I actually don't really think it's that easy in, uh, at all. Um, the, the, the truth of the matter is um, some regions will have uh, regulation that does take into account agency and other parts of the world won't um, have those same safeguards as, as we've seen um, in, in, in certain parts of the world. Um, it really is incumbent upon our global institutions to think about what we need to do to address these problems. I've heard a lot of discussions on um, do we need a new um, uh, multinational uh, stakeholder community that, that, that puts all the issues that they're, uh, all of these challenges are introducing, be it climate change and sustainability. Certainly, um, there are questions to be um, considered there and the role of artificial intelligence in both being a problem and, and a solution to that issue. Um, and then, you know, any, any human rights issue, um, they all need to be thought through, especially as we see artificial intelligence continue to play a role in all of the technology applications, certainly the good and, as Anne-Marie points out, um, the, the challenges, the, 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 the more concerning applications of the technology. Thank you. Catherine, you stay there. I'm going to go far right over here. Hey, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Michael Weinraub. I'm a learning advisor at Pixel. And this question is for Ms. Duarte. You said something interesting before when you were talking about making sufficient progress on climate sensitive goals globally. You said it's not merely a matter of resources or accessibility, but policy. And then you said something which was very interesting, understated, but very interesting. You said, but a lot of those things aren't popular. Um, and I wonder if you can give, uh, I wonder if you can say more about that. And is there a particular area uh, or policy area that you think is unpopular, but really needs to be addressed? Um, I mean, there are various, um, but, you know, one, of course, is fossil fuel subsidy reform. Um, continue to see billions and billions of dollars in fossil fuel subsidies. Um, and, you know, for, and we know that uh, most of these subsidies, they are regressive in the sense that they tend to favor more those that consume more, which tend to be the wealthier. But nevertheless, they still benefit also the, 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 the poorest and the, you know, the, the lower incomes also benefit, not to, to, the, to the extent that the higher income groups do, but they also benefit. And of course, you know, it's, it's very difficult to then get support to these, to these changes. There are ways, again, of, of dealing with this and compensating. The, the, the low income groups, um, uh, which, you know, as a matter of fact, the, the share that of their income that they end up uh, spending on, on these items is, is, quite, is quite high. So these are not uh, extraordinarily popular. I mean, the, um, unless, you know, they are done in a way that gives confidence to the people that, and particularly the, the, the lower income ones, that they will not stand to lose. In these transitions um, that we are talking about, uh, and I'm sorry, I can't see this, the speaker from here, but in these transitions that we, are, that we are talking about, issues of just transition, uh, you know, the, the, this whole dimension of uh, who stands to, to gain and who stands to lose, and how are we making sure that uh, we are not you know, allowing already those that are vulnerable and the lower income groups to low, lower income groups to, to bear the brunt is really Im, Im, important. For example, on coal transition, and we see this because we are involved in this in this uh, topic in in countries like South Africa, Indonesia, we will be in India. Um, Coal transition, this is a source of income for thousands and thousands and millions of people. Um, and unless if we really, you know, put in place programs and measures and policies that give the confidence 
to the communities that they will not stand to lose, they will not lose their livelihoods, that there will be other opportunities for them. They will oppose, and, they will, and, they, and we cannot expect anything else from them because it's a matter of, of livelihoods for them. So these are just some of the examples, but there, there are um, many more. Um, this is why it's not sufficient to work just on the level of the financing. I'll take your question. Thank you very much. I'm Chloe Schwenke from the Center for Values and International Development. I want to ask a question specifically about Can you speak AI. up a little bit? I'm sorry. Yeah. Specifically, we'd like to ask a question about AI. Um, I, as an ethicist and a researcher, we all know that with anything to do with computers, rubbish in and rubbish out. It really depends on, with machine learning for AI, you have to have access to data. Now, as a researcher who has worked in India, in Africa, and many other countries, data is in short supply, and it's often not particularly good quality, and many people are missing from data. Uh, vulnerable people, women are often missing from data. Um, how are we going to see machine learning happen when data is so weak? Similarly, in the ethics field, machine ethics is a, is a well-established field in so many industries, except it does not exist right now in humanitarian response and international development. There are not ethicists working, I know this, I'm an ethicist, there are not ethicists working in this space right now. Is this a baseline when you, the first time that SID has talked about artificial intelligence, should we be looking at this point as the time to start is now? Develop these capacities to expand data, to make it robust enough that AI can work for the global south and to get machine ethics to start by doing the important ethical analysis that has yet to begin. Yeah, as an ethicist, I'm sure you can appreciate the tensions between data privacy and the ability to train artificial intelligence systems on a diverse set of data. So, and certainly, again, going back to the previous remarks I made, that's a real challenge, right? If you consider what's, what some countries might do with a very diverse set of data. So it's something that I think, um, not, and not sure if there's an opportunity perhaps in the international development space to think about what are the things that are in tension and how do we overcome them? What are some guidelines that we can think of for specifically those who are working in this space to deploy them safely and um, frankly in a way that does give agency to people to the other question that we got in on the chat. Um, I, these aren't easy questions, and certainly people like you who have an experience in, ethic, uh, in ethics, but also understand the on-the-ground impacts, that's a real opportunity to start a conversation. I will not pretend to have any of the answers, more that, again, going back to Anne-Marie's um, earlier statement, that's where, that's where networks come in, right? That's where we all have to get together and say, what are, the, what are the opportunities, and then what are the challenges, and how do we bridge the gaps? That's the only way you're going to solve them. And I think in an area of, of technology as specific as international aid and international development, even that presents a ton of diversity. Food, flood, um, you know, anything that needs to, that affects people on the ground all need very specific considerations. And really, um, only, only you can do it, right? Only the community that's closest to it. And that's, that's really the, the point that we really try to hammer home with all the policymakers we talk to globally. You have to be closest to the impact to understand it and to mitigate against it. And while you know, a high level regulatory approach can, can certainly bring us into alignment, just like the OECD's AI principles have brought us a little closer in alignment between perhaps you know, the US and Europe, and other countries who were signers, it really is you need to keep going down levels and levels and levels until you really address the impacts of the technology right where you live and right where you're trying to apply them. Thank you. Catherine. I have a lot. I'm, I think we have time for just one more. Um, so I'm going to use a short one, but there are a lot of really interesting questions online for those who want to engage. You can engage afterwards on the platform with these questions. Um, what is, this is from Julia de la Cruz. What is the one main recommendation you have for advancing international development outcomes through AI, climate finance, and geologic levers? All right. So for this, we'll start with you, Anne-Marie. Hmm. 
so my my recommendation would be that every mayor of every city of a certain size, mid-size and large cities, have a, a point a, 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 a an official for international affairs, like, like Nina Hachigian was uh, Garcetti's deputy mayor for international affairs in LA. There's one in New York. Uh, but I would create the local infrastructure specifically to engage with others at whatever at the, whatever level of cities they were there were to tackle uh, global common problems that are global, but that means they're also local. And the example I give where it worked very effectively was counterterrorism, right? When there was an attack in Jakarta, you know, the p folks in New York, but also many more mid-sized cities immediately figured out, you know, what was what were the learnings? What did they need to do? That's the kind of thing we need on global health, on global, uh, again, on, on uh, climate change, but food shortages, water shortages, energy shortages. That's what I would do. Yeah, I would actually second that. Um, I was actually just briefing a sort of mayor's office, the equivalent in that city's uh, mayor's office, and they were they were asking, you know, how do I get my staff trained? We have a whole host of problems around the city. I know this technology could probably help my small staff of 40 address them. And and it really is not not necessarily. Um, coming up with a plan for that specific problem, first you gotta understand the technology. The really interesting thing about large language models is how accessible it is. And I think that's the, that's the thing that both scares us and gives us a lot of hope for the future. Um, there's a sort of a joke in the engineering community that um, the most popular coding language is not Python or PyTorch, it's now English. Because you can code anything just by saying, um, uh, please give me a garden box layout that has tomatoes, apples, and oranges. You can also think of how you can apply that to any city's problem. How do I come up with a new schedule for routing trash pickup? How do I use this tool to anticipate flooding and critical infrastructure? How do I use it to identify potholes in the city to make sure that we're doing equitable scanning of, of addressing neighborhoods' problems? Um, it really is understanding the tools, because also once you get to understand the tools, you start understanding the problems too. And it's not one of those technologies that you can just sit back and read about. You really have to get your hands dirty to understand what are the potential problems and, challenge, uh, and opportunities. And that's what we're encouraging everybody at the local to the to the international level to really understand use the technology understand its limitations as well thank you hold up yeah i'm not going to suggest some something to uh, to all i'm going to suggest that each one of us becomes the champion that we can be on climate because you know sometimes we forget that we are actually quite powerful as individuals um, you know, we are not just consumers and producers, we are investors, we are educators, we are voters. Um, and so if we really embrace this and, and, and be the best champions we can and convince our networks to be the best champions they can, I think we can make a big difference. All right, so we're going to empower ourselves, use the artificial intelligence tools, and think globally. That's the answer. All right, so I want to take this opportunity to thank my, my, my panelists, I think, for a really interesting discussion. Um, thank people for, for asking uh, really interesting questions. And um, that concludes our panel. Wish you all enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. I have to Thanks, Emery. I'm going to take this off. I thought those of you who are still here might like to hear what one of the other questions online was. They said, note, this question was formed using OpenAI's chat GPT when prompted with what it would ask this panel. Considering the transformative impact of artificial intelligence, how can international development initiatives harness the potential of AI to drive inclusive and sustainable development for local communities globally? Not, not that interesting, but anyway. Um, I just want to conclude lunch by showing the second of our lightning talks uh, for those who are still here. Um, Simon Brown.
from Sight Savers on inclusive futures, a generational change on disability inclusive employment. People with disabilities all around the world are only half as likely to be active in the labor market as those without disabilities. And even when they're active, are twice as likely to be unemployed. The consequence of that is a $6 trillion cost to the global economy, and that just doesn't make sense. Why would a system prioritize sustaining people out of the labor force instead of encouraging them into it? We need to learn to start together, identify the challenges together, and identify solutions together so that we are walking that journey together. Inclusive Futures has done exactly that. We've invested significant time in much better understanding how labor markets function or dysfunction relative to disability and came out with some interesting conclusions. What we found was there are a lot of companies all around the world who really want to be more inclusive of, of people with disabilities in their workforces. Many have tried often struggled and are asking for help and not to be told off while at the same time people with disabilities of course aspire to the same kinds of careers the same kinds of jobs as everybody else but often lack the self-confidence to go after those opportunities and then we started to look at the solutions together working with some really pioneering companies in africa and south asia companies like diageo and Safaricom and Coca-Cola Beverages Africa and MTN and Unilever and Standard Chartered Bank, training thousands of staff and managers in hundreds of companies to be more confident around disability, while at the same time identifying and adapting training programs for people with disabilities so that they can get the skills to, to, to get a job. We've got an amazing partnership with Accenture on their skills to succeed learning exchange, but also other platforms like Cisco's global IT academies. And piloting a really innovative approach to mentoring job seekers through HR practitioners and the Chartered Institute of Personnel Management in Nigeria. Developing and nurturing national business and disability networks with the ILO as knowledge exchanges between employers who then have access to the expertise of organizations of persons with disabilities. And finally, working with the regulatory frameworks of labor markets to try and encourage more inclusion or incentivize inclusion rather than only punish conscious or deliberate exclusion. But we've really only scratched the surface. It is going to be a generation of change, but the returns on that investment are astronomical. Thank you. So we have uh, more in-person breakouts across the hall. We have um, refugees and climate change. And there's more vir virtual breakouts happening in our virtual viewing rooms and the exhibit hall. Thanks.